Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to top that. I'm not bringing anything on the space station. So um, we'll have to see how it goes. Uh, so is this too loud? Can everybody hear me? Too loud or is it too loud? Yeah. How about that? How about that? Is that better? Better, good. All right, at least I'm not echoing. Okay, um, so thank you very much for that kind introduction, and I appreciate uh, being here, uh, even though this is the last Science Cafe. I've been to a couple of them, and they've uh, actually been pretty inspiring to me um, to see how some of the other professors here at OU are conducting research and um, bringing it to you in a very sort of creative and uh, broad general fashion. Um, and that's kind of what I want to do today. Um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about some of the inspiration that uh, drives me as a scientist and drives me as a uh, educator um, here at OU. And um, I'd like to bring to you um, a concept or uh, almost a philosophy uh, known as biomimicry, okay? And biomimicry is uh, essentially a concept um, that, um, humanistic concept uh, that uh, looks to nature uh, for form and function uh, to inspire um, innovations. Um, and I have a couple of examples up here, um, and some of them include innovations uh, such as engineering, uh, designing cars um, and planes and trains and things like that to get us around. Um, other forms of inspiration that are found in nature include artwork, shown here um, in a sculpture of, uh, sculpture of wood uh, that's uh, sort of, uh, uh, I guess, reminiscent of uh, scales of a reptile. Um, also, uh, it also inspires architecture. Right? We can see here how sort of these hexagonal forms um, are building these sort of domes um, around these uh, 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 sort of uh, geo um, uh, structures uh, that are found out in um, various parts of uh, the desert. Um, additionally, uh, form and function can also inspire um, things like tents or, or, or other structures that are smaller um, and even go down to the micro uh, 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 scale uh, where we are actually mimicking gecko feet um, to, uh, to, to uh, manufacture and uh, generate uh, um, uh, tapes and adhesives and things like that. Um, and in addition to that, uh, from the macro all the way down to the micro scale, uh, we're actually getting to the point nowadays where we're actually looking to biomimicry as ways to generate um, small molecules and even proteins uh, to uh, have some sort of therapeutic benefit or even um, enable us to um, uh, engineer and design molecules that allow us to understand complex biological processes. And that's essentially, that's where I'm coming from, from all this. I'm coming from this, uh, from a biomimicry standpoint, from a, uh, from a molecular point of view. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to talk, I want to start out the talk by talking about some of the innovations that mankind has come up with over the past maybe 50 to 100 years um, in the more macro scale uh, with engineering. And then I'll sort of wrap up the talk with the molecules that I study and how it sort of inspires my lab to pursue uh, various forms of um, uh, biomimicry. Okay? So um, just to give a quick uh, overview of the presentation, I don't want this to be some sort of, um, you know, just, just me up here blathering on about biomimicry. If you guys have questions, please yell them out, ask me, whatever. Um, I want this to be sort of interactive. Um, and I have a bunch of my students out there in the audience, and they obviously can't get enough of me talking in front of group meeting or even in front of classes, so they're here. So I'm looking forward to them actually asking some questions. All right? So I'll start out talking a little bit about of a background of biomimicry and, and where it comes from and, and some of the inspirations that have, um, that have been uh, uh, historically uh, um, relevant. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the principles of biomimicry, why um, it's uh, uh, what the philosophy is and actually how people go about um, uh, uh, approaching uh, this particular subject. I'll then talk a little bit about some of the historical approaches to biomimicry. Uh, I'll then talk a little bit about the organizational levels of biomimetics and how things uh, go from a macro scale all the way down to a micro scale, even to a nano scale, um, which I'll talk about towards the end. I'll then talk a little bit about some of the case studies and examples of biomimicry that are sort of uh, out there nowadays that are inspiring technological innovations um, and also uh, uh, other um, types of um, uh, innovations occurring, uh, such as molecular innovations, things like that. Um, and uh, some of the innovations that are being performed for um, uh, a lot of different companies uh, that are coming out for uh, products that can be um, uh, uh, disseminated to the society. Okay? Um, I'll then uh, sort of wrap up the talk with uh, the, the, the subject that sort of drives me in my lab, um, and essentially the biomimetic therapeutics 
uh, designing molec molecules uh, to help us uh, treat diseases and even to better understand complex biological processes. Then I'll talk a little bit about some of the conclusions and future directions uh, where biomimetics is going. And hopefully, this talk will sort of inspire you to look at nature um, in a different way. Okay? What I want everybody to come away from this talk, looking at nature as a way to inspire you for various types of um, uh, innovations, whether that be artwork, whether it be some work in the humanities, whether it be work in science, engineering, physics, chemistry, biology, anything like that. And so up here, I have an example of a biomimetic approach to design a, um, a, a water mixer, okay? Pax Technologies is a company that designs these big, huge vats that uh, essentially mix water um, for water treatment, okay? And what they did was they actually looked to the spiral form of a calla lily, which is essentially designed to funnel water down through into its uh, sort of central area here. Okay, I'm not a botanist, so I'm not exactly sure what that is. I mean, it's pestle or pistol from my eighth grade uh, botany. Uh, but basically, this, this uh, form here is designed to funnel water down into this area of the, of the actual uh, flower. Okay? And what they did was they actually designed this water mixer to mimic this calla lily form and essentially its function. And what they found was they had a huge increase in efficiency with respect to the mixing efficiency of this guy versus just a standard paddle that they used to use. Okay? So again, if we look deep into nature, as uh, Albert Einstein said, um, you will find the answers. Okay? So Albert Einstein, uh, even though he was talking about special relativity and uh, looking at uh, sort of a, a, a universal approach to this whole thing, um, if you look deep enough into nature, you may find uh, answers to the very problems you're looking for. Okay? And I hope to inspire everybody here with today to look to nature to find form and function that might enable them to advance or at least um, uh, drive their own innovations. Okay? So basically, what are biomimetics and what does biomimicry mean? Okay? So sorry for the wordiness of this slide. It'll get less wordy as, as the talk goes on. But basically, biomimicry is the imitation of models, systems, and our other elements found in nature uh, for the purpose of solving complex human problems. Okay? These problems may be um, try to mix water, right? Like I just mentioned on that example. These problems may be how to reduce drag in uh, various types of submarines underwater. These problems might be how to design potential therapeutics, right? So essentially, biomimicry is the imitation of models uh, of systems or elements of nature for the purpose of solving complex human problems, okay? The term, of course, comes from ancient Greek, bios meaning life, mimesis meaning imitation. Um, and, or acting, and uh, essentially, uh, this is where the term comes from. Uh, biomimetics essentially operates on the principle that nature has had almost a 3.8 billion year head start on our own innovations, okay? Um, and nature has essentially found practical use uh, for a wide variety of, um, of, of, uh, of structures, and a wide variety of uh, animals, essentially, or plants, animals, life in general, um, to solve many problems uh, that plague us even as humans. Okay? We'll talk a little bit about some of these examples uh, in more uh, specifics in a little bit. Um, essentially, some of the major problems that nature has, has, has solved for us, essentially, um, include uh, self-assembly, all right? things that can actually aggregate in a, in a, in a well-ordered fashion to be able to build up larger and larger structures that might be very stable. Also, hydrophobicity, which is the ability for it to repel water. Uh, things like leaves of, of lotus petals and things like that um, have an astounding ability to be hydrophobic. And uh, we can use these uh, types of, um, of uh, properties uh, to engineer and design uh, surfaces or something like that for buildings or even hulls of ships. Um, in addition, uh, tolerance to environmental exposure um, is also uh, a uh, major um, uh, problem that uh, nature has solved. I mean, a lot of animals are capable of, of holding on to a lot of heat. Um, and um, additionally, for self-healing and uh, also harnessing solar energy, of course, from uh, the, the plant biome, right? Um, what, what's interesting about this is that biomimicry uh, or biomimetics in general is an extremely highly interdisciplinary subject, all right? It integrates many, many aspects of physics, uh, biology, engineering, chemistry, mathematics, and even geology 
on some level. Um, and uh, what's nice about the field in general right now is that it's sort of in its not really infancy, but what it's really doing is it's, it's providing for a highly collaborative efforts across a wide range of disciplines uh, throughout all of these scientific fields. And in general, any field or any philosophy that can actually do that in this global society um, is essentially a, 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 a relatively, um, I think, powerful uh, uh, humanistic uh, uh, approach. Okay? And um, as I mentioned, as a principle, essentially biomedics has influenced such fields as architecture, electronics, medicine, um, even art and sculpture, um, painting. Um, and what's important is that it influences these fields on a variety of scales, okay? It's not just the macro scale like influencing architecture. It's not just the meso scale of you know, influencing things that we can sit on, right? Or even like, you know, tents, things like that. But it's also on the micro scale and nano scale now that our sophistication is becoming much more, um, or sophisticated instrumentation is becoming much more uh, widely used and we are now able to mimic things on the nanoscale uh, that we haven't been able to do before. And essentially, this level of, uh, of biomimetics is, is essentially revolutionizing medicine um, at this point. Okay? So, if we can move on here. Um, essentially, I just wanted to talk really quickly about um, some of the principles of biomimicry and some of the design lenses that people use to, uh, to look at this, basically. Um, what we have are life's principles are basically nature's uh, uh, lessons from nature, okay? And uh, nature has evolved uh, a variety of different um, uh, 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 processes uh, to allow it to um, uh, th survive and thrive, okay? And life's principles basically represent overarching patterns found among surviving and thriving species, which include adaptation to changing conditions, um, evolution uh, to be able to survive, um, basically, use uh, one of my favorite here is uh, use li life-friendly chemistry. Um, if you have a, a, a series of animals or, or even uh, uh, um, microbes um, that are uh, toxic to the system or toxic to the environment, uh, life will not thrive, right? So basically, we have to use life-friendly chemistry uh, in, order to, uh, in order to have a, a surviving and thriving species. Um, additionally, uh, life must be resource efficient. Uh, to be able to, um, to go ahead and, uh, and survive. Um, we can't use all of our resources or else we will uh, eventually um, perish, okay? Uh, one of the most important aspects about biomimicry as a philosophy in general is that all life on Earth is essentially interconnected and subject to similar operating conditions, okay? And that means that all life on Earth has to deal with gravity. All life on Earth has to deal with pressures. All life on Earth has to deal with communication or interaction with other animals or, or, or other systems on some level, right? So essentially, all life on Earth is, 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 is interconnected and subject to a similar operating conditions. Um, and of course, we can all say that life is sustained for over 3.8 billion years, uh, you, uh, realizing these um, types of uh, processes. And uh, that's important for us to look to this to as, a, um, as a sort of uh, a, a way to approach um, our biomimetic um, innovations. Okay? Um, and of course, life integrates these strategies to, uh, to create conditions conducive to life. And of course, by learning from these lessons, we can uh, design innovative strategies um, to model uh, nature's success. All right? Okay, so um, are there any questions about any of this so far? Anybody understand where we're at? All right. So does anybody know who this fine looking gentleman is right here? Who? Anyone? I would judge by the hat, I would say maybe late 15th, early 16th century. Does that help anybody? No one? Anybody has any idea what the, who this is? Any art majors in here? All right, well, it's, uh, I know it's the end of the semester, everybody, but this is Leonardo da Vinci, okay? Everybody should know who this is, right? Great. So, Leonardo da Vinci was um, probably one of, the mo uh, one of the foremost forefathers of biomimicry, in essence, um, essentially, for his, his innovations were um, some of the first to be historically um, recorded, um, okay, and, and, and essentially uh, accurate with respect to uh, various types of anatomy, um, other types of uh, structures that he was um, trying to build, okay? And so if we take Leonardo here and we add the concept of a flying bat, we get sort of a uh, mechanical wing device uh, shown here that uh, da Vinci came up with way back in 1485, okay? This was uh, well before um, anybody was able to fly any planes, okay? And he also designed a flying machine uh, around 1488 that um, I don't know who volunteered to be taken up in the rooftops of Venice and pushed off on this thing, but um, I certainly wouldn't have been. 
And um, basically, uh, I don't know if this thing ever actually, quote unquote, got off the ground. Um, but uh, basically, um, this was the first sort of attempt at looking at nature uh, to uh, design, uh, or at least a historically recorded attempt, to look at nature uh, to design a uh, sort of mimetic approach um, to use nature's fun form and function to design or at least solve a complex human problem, which in this case would be manned flight. Okay? And of course, we can say that probably about 415 or so odd years later, uh, not much happened in between then, except maybe an American Revolution here and there. And uh, we do have uh, the Wright Brothers prototype, uh, which started flying around 1903. Uh, and finally, about 110 years later or so, we actually do have the modern jets. And um, of course, I don't want to say that both of these look similar by any stretch of the imagination. But if someone who had never seen either of these before could probably draw some correlation between the wings and uh, essentially the overall form of this bat and this modern jet. Okay? So these are probably the, the first inklings and the first sort of rumblings of biomimicry being kicked around um, uh, in human uh, ingenuity and human innovation. Okay? All right. So flash forward about maybe, I would say, 400 and some odd years, maybe 410 years or so. And uh, we come to the actual forefather, uh, the actual, uh, uh, probably say forefather, of, um, of biomimicry in general. And this guy, his name is Otto Herbert Schmidt. Okay? And um, Herbert Schmidt was uh, actually an electrician by trade, or at least uh, you know, he was, he was uh, academic and, and a scholar. Um, but he actually spent much of his childhood experimenting with electrical phenomena. Okay? He, started, um, he took a big uh, uh, influence from Edison. And uh, I don't know if he was actually electrocuting as many animals as, as Edison was at the time. But he basically did um, experiment a lot with electrical phenomena in his childhood. He then uh, graduated and spent most of his career at the University of Minnesota, um, a little further north of here, um, experimenting uh, using, uh, with electrical engineering. Um, but in his, in his spare time, he also studied biology, physics, and mathematics. And he essentially helped create new interdisciplinary fields, such as bioengineering and biophysics. Okay, so this was also some of the first time that the, the more uh, technologically advanced society was starting to bring in these two sort of drastically um, uh, polarized, or, you know, uh, like I would say, um, uh, uh, different fields, such as biology, physics, and engineering in general. Okay? Um, he actually coined the term biomimetics uh, when he was a PhD student, when he was writing his thesis. Um, and um, he also invented something known as the Schmidt trigger and something known as the cathode follower. Okay? And essentially the Schmidt trigger was probably one of the first direct results um, of biomimicry in general. And uh, he actually got the inspiration when he was studying squid nerve impulse propagation. And shown here is uh, a nerve cell. Shown here is the axon of a nerve cell. And if anybody's ever taken biology, uh, they should know that um, in general, or cell biology, they should know that there's an there's a, um, action potential across this axon. Okay? And the nerve impulse basically is an electrical impulse that gets charged and then it's released. Okay? It's charged and then released. And what he noticed was that these nerve impulses were actually propagated down this axon. Okay? And that these nerve impulses can actually be um, fed back through the axon itself and uh, to essentially stop or at least enhance um, both, stop or enhance uh, nerve impulses traveling down these, these, uh, these axons. Okay? This was a pretty big step um, in, uh, in, in uh, bio, uh, biophysics um, way back in 19, I guess this was probably 1952, 1953. Um, and essentially he came up with this idea known as the Schmidt trigger. And I'm no electrician and I'm no real electrical engineer, but what, um, what I understand about this whole thing is the fact that um, what his uh, trigger did was essentially lower the noise from an analog current that's being passed through a specific circuit. Okay? And what his circuit did was it actually created a feedback mechanism to uh, put power back into the input following output of a uh, specific impulse. Okay? And what that did was that created a sort of hysteresis in this, uh, in, this uh, in this electrical impulse where it sort of shifted this entire uh, electrical impulse further down um, the, uh, the, I guess the, uh, I guess I would say that this is the, the current profile. Okay? And what that did was essentially it lowered the noise from an analog input. Okay? And essentially what this did was you have up, down, up, down, up, down. And right here is a lot of noise. But since this whole thing is actually shifted a little bit further to the right than this original one, because you have this sort of feedback mechanism here, you actually lower the ability for this noise to have an influence over this current. 
And this was a huge deal, apparently. This was, this was uh, a big, big deal back then. And actually, Schmidt triggers are even used nowadays, and there's a symbol for them in, in electric uh, engineering. And so essentially, um, I wanted to draw a correlation between the nerve impulse or the electrical impulse here, which actually has um, some, a lot of noise to it, um, with, the, uh, with the nerve impulse that's been um, uh, shown here uh, using action potentials from nerve, uh, from nerve endings from squid. Okay? So basically, this was sort of the first sort of rumblings, again, of, uh, of biomimicry within, uh, a, a, from an engineering standpoint. All right? And so flash forward a couple years again, and uh, biomimicry is essentially gaining a lot of traction, not only in the sense of, um, of engineering, but also as a philosophy of business models. All right? And this woman right here, uh, Janine uh, Benyus, uh, actually uh, was born and educated in central New Jersey. Uh, she went to Rutgers, right around the corner from where I grew up. And um, right now, she's essentially teaching interpretive writing, which I don't really know what that is, at the, but uh, it's at University of Montana. And uh, she works as an environmental activist out there. And um, she's a huge, uh, she's a huge um, proponent of, of biomimicry, and she's been studying this pretty much her whole life. And uh, she's authored six books on the subject of biomimicry and co-founded this thing called the Biomimicry Guild. Okay? And the Biomimicry Guild is a consortium that helps innovators and companies such as GE and uh, you know, other, other large co corporations and even universities uh, to design and learn from and emulate natural models to design sustainable products. Okay? If anybody's interested in this, they can look at biomimicry.net. Um, and this is, a, this is a big consortium that uh, you, know, you can actually hire uh, to have people come out and give you ideas on how to um, maybe innovate your product and, and get something going uh, with respect to uh, sustainable models from nature. All right? Uh, one interesting thing that she was really involved in was actually engineering uh, water-resistant coatings uh, for buildings and boats and things like that um, to emulate lotus plant leaves. Okay, here's a lotus petal, and we can see how the water beads up on that very, very, uh, very, very efficiently. And uh, what she was able to do was generate um, a water-resistant coating uh, from, uh, from this uh, type of engineering principle. Okay? So... All historical after, uh, you know, uh, references aside, uh, we can now talk a little bit about some of the uh, order and uh, some of the organizational levels of how biomimicry works. Okay? So there are essentially three levels to biomimicry. There's the organism level, there's um, the environmental level, and then there's the ecosystem level. And we'll talk just more specifically about the organism level here. So essentially, if we wanted to design a, 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 a building okay, that, that mimics termites, all right? And we're not saying mimics termites uh, uh, mounds, but we're saying we're actually mimicking a termite. It might actually be better to talk about not necessarily a building that mimics termites, but maybe a, a, a small crawling uh, uh, robot that mimics termites. All right? There are a couple of, of levels that need to be uh, 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 looked at um, in order to, um, uh, in order to, uh, to start to uh, build and, and facilitate this type of process. One is the form of the actual, uh, uh, the actual model itself. And now, do we want this thing to actually look like a termite? Does it need to be looking exactly like a termite? The other thing is material. Now, is the building or the robot made from the same material as a termite? Um, you know, who knows? That might be something that you want to think about. Uh, construction, uh, is the building made in the same way as a termite? Is it, are the connections the same? Um, does it go through various growth cycles, for example? Um, additionally, process, the building works in the same way as an individual termite or function, the building or robot functions like a termite in a larger context with respect to the society at large or, or the environment that it's actually interacting with. Okay? Now again, this doesn't necessarily need to be a building. It's probably easier to think about this more of on a behavior, behavior, behavioral level or an ecosystem level where essentially you have the building looking like it was made by a termite or the material the building is made from the same materials that a termite builds with. So essentially what I want to discuss here is that biomimicry doesn't necessarily need to have just the form, function, process, construction, or material that the, pro the, that the, uh, that the organism or the, uh, the, the type of subject it's trying to mimic. But what can happen is, is that can, it can take from any one of these particular levels uh, and any one of these forms, construction, processes, function, um, in order to really build on that. Okay? And so basically, um, these types of levels here um, are, are important. And what I want to contend is that actually there's a whole other level involved with this, okay, which is actually going to be the molecular level. So this is all on the macro scale, right? 
And later on in the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to sort of remodulate these principles of biomimicry to include the molecular level as well, so we can go after molecules that might actually be able to help us better understand complex disease processes or even uh, help us um, you know, design potential therapeutics. Okay? So just wanted to give an idea of the principles of biomimicry and how organizational levels are approached. And um, essentially, that's how people go about designing these types of um, uh, 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 innovations uh, for uh, these types of um, uh, biomimetic processes. Okay? All right. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the examples of innovation that um, are, are included in, 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 the, natu in uh, the modern world. Okay? And some of the examples of innovation that have been inspired um, by nature. Okay? So if anybody grew up in Ohio or even uh, the Northeast, when I was about 10 years old, I used to come out with, um, back home with uh, tons of these things, not cats, but uh, tons of burrs um, all over me uh, when I was a kid. And this cat has obviously had uh, a bit of a run-in with a plant, uh, probably a burdock burr, okay, like that. And so these guys right here are, um, are shown uh, in this sense. And uh, what we get a microscopic view of these hooks um, we can actually see that they do, um, uh, they have a very, very um, uh, efficient form uh, to process their function, okay? These guys are able to hook into cat fur, any sort of material that you might have, and they're able to be able to transport it miles and miles and miles away to essentially drive their species propagation, okay? Now, can anybody think of a potential innovation that came from uh, the inspiration from burrs? Velcro, exactly. Very good. Very good. Innovation. Velcro. Very nice. Here are two Velcro um, pieces. Here is a scanning electron micrograph of Velcro hooks. We can see that they're actually very similar to these burr hooks. And of course, if we looked at this cat hair, uh, we might actually see that it was maybe less matted than this. Uh, but these Velcro loops are shown here. Okay. So again, I want to make a point that this is form imitating form to modulate function. Okay. Next thing, uh, which is actually kind of interesting, uh, that's actually getting a lot of traction, uh, no pun intended, uh, over, the next, uh, over the past maybe 10 years or so, is um, an inspiration from gecko feet. Okay? And gecko feet actually contain these sort of ridge, like they sort of tire treads on their feet, and uh, they contain, they're called lamella. All right? And if we look closer at them, what happens is that we can actually see that they are composed of these microscopic hairs that are called setae. All right? And these setae actually are composed, or actually branch off even further and further into these, uh, these very, very tiny um, uh, biomolecular or bio uh, 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 structures uh, known as spatulate, uh, sp spatulae. Okay? And these guys are actually really small. They're actually smaller than the wavelengths of visible light. And um, we actually could only see them with electron microscopy or um, electron um, micrographs. All right? So now um, people are actually starting to look at these different types of uh, 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 bio, um, bio structures and, and, and organs, essentially, that allow a gecko to walk on like, just essentially any sort of smooth surface, including glass. Okay? And what they're doing is they're actually using these to engineer very, very uh, uh, um, uh, tough and uh, very adhesive um, uh, 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 tapes. Okay? And in this case, this is gecko grip tape. I, didn't, I was actually going to try to find some of this, but it, it's actually kind of expensive. Um, and so I was going to pass some around, but um, they have uh, what, what what they do is they basically create these synthetic setae on the um, on the uh, gecko grip tape, and what it's able to do is it's actually able to hold very 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 tightly uh, to um, to various uh, to even glass. So this guy is hanging um, uh, in glass, and this is what they do out at the University of Kiel in Germany: is they stick things to the wall and they hang from it, uh, which is fine. Um, but essentially, this is, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to do this with a piece of masking tape, that's for sure, even if you had probably, uh, you know, buckets of it, all right? So essentially, these, these types of um, uh, uh, innovations are, are arising because of our ability to understand complex biological systems, all right? And the overall mechanisms of these, if anybody's interested of, of uh, you know, anybody physicists in the audience, uh, these actually are, are designed to, or they think that they're designed to, um, to create van der Waals interactions amongst themselves and amongst the, the actual uh, uh, surface that they're, um, that they're uh, hitting. And they have such a high surface area that um, they're able to sort of stick. And the way the gecko actually unsticks is he uh, or she pulls away at a different angle than they stepped. 
And what they're finding is that these synthetic tapes actually are able to be removed if you, very easily, because if you have something like this and you can't get it off, what's the point, right? Basically, you're able to remove it if you use it, if you, if you actually pull it from a different angle. So what's happening here in general is that our uh, basic innovations and our understanding of biology is driving innovation and really profoundly affecting our ability to understand how these natural systems and how these uh, b you know, engineered systems really work. Okay, questions on any of this? All right, so um, I'll continue on a little bit with some of the examples of uh, human innovation inspired by nature here. Uh, here I mentioned a little bit previously about the lotus petal. I'll just go through real quickly about some wetting forces here. If anybody uh, who understands wetting forces, uh, we actually have um, liquids that um, will uh, create um, adhesive forces uh, with uh, a surface. There's also cohesive forces uh, amongst the liquid itself, okay? And there's actually something called the Young Equation. I'm not going to go into this too deeply. But essentially, the ability for um, a surface to be wetted, quote unquote, is uh, the ability for um, this liquid here uh, to be um, varied between the cohesive and the uh, adhesive forces, okay? The adhesive forces actually have to be a lot less than the cohesive forces for a uh, surface to remain dry, okay? And but basically, the angle theta here is what drives the, uh, what, what pronounces the, the wetted ability. So you can imagine that if this liquid was a bead sitting on there with a very, very low surface, inter uh, uh, low, uh, surface area interaction, this theta would actually be very large, okay? Because so, that's the angle between that and its connection, all right? So you can imagine if this was more spherical, theta would be a lot larger, indicating a solid that is not as wetted as something that, like this, okay? And so there are a couple of models to this. People started thinking about this as physics and as engineers. Uh, they started looking at the ability for these dimpled surfaces um, to actually be uh, uh, um, uh, uh, wetted versus not wetted and the hydrophobic effects of these types of things. There's Cassie and Wenzel state. And the other reason I bring this up is because this was actually seen, uh, and this, this model here was actually well known well before uh, scanning electron microscopy. Okay? And um, something called the lotus effect that people started looking at were, um, was basically the fact that water will not bead at all or will not absorb at all onto lotus leaves, all right? And there's got to be some sort of biological reason for this, right? This is a biological entity. It's not, you know, it's not making any sort of, uh, 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 you know, so it's not engineering anything. What it's doing is it's doing everything biologically when it's making its leaves and organs. And basically what they found, of course, was that there are, they, they hypothesized that there are these sort of microstructures that sit off of the lotus leaf and they, have these, uh, they might have these crystals that are hanging off of them that essentially keep this water from penetrating into the Wenzel state, into this uh, lotus leaf, okay? And what they've actually found in, in recent research is that the lotus leaf actually stays clean because of this whole interaction, all right? The water actually can take debris away from the lotus leaf and clean it, uh, allowing it to uh, have better respiration. And lo and behold, once they actually had scanning electron microscopy available, they found these little microstructures on lotus leaves, okay? And uh, so the theory uh, was proven correct. And um, what they started doing was manufacturing uh, surfaces uh, to, uh, to mimic these types of microstructures, all right? And if you can look really closely, you can actually see that these microstructures here are not smooth. They're actually kind of ribbed, and they have sort of these uh, ridges and bumps in them all along their, uh, their, um, their, uh, their, their structures, all right? And so what people started thinking about was, okay, if this right here is smooth, how can we go ahead and generate these sort of hierarchical structures of these very, very short uh, 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 sort of um, uh, hairs that are hanging off of here, uh, and they use evaporation, they use wax and things like that uh, to sort of mimic this. But basically what they found was that these hierarchical structures of these, um, uh, of these little uh, uh, beads right here can actually generate very, very hydrophobic coatings, okay? And again, this is sort of a biomimetic approach to hydrophobic coatings, all right? And uh, just a couple more examples real quick here. Uh, we have inspiration from Mako Shark. Uh, Mako sharks actually contain these, uh, actually all sharks in general, contain these sort of interleaved uh, sort of scales on them that are, are called dentricles, all right? And they're thought to reduce drag, uh, and they're also thought to have antimicrobial properties, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail in a second. Um, but basically the way that this is supposed to work, and this, this theory is kind of being debunked right now um, in, you know, in my, in my uh, reading about this, um, but essentially the way that these, thought were, these were thought to work 
was that um, you have a, a, a lamina boundary layer for, for water flow over a moving shark through the water. Okay? The water is going to be going down this way. When the, when the shark moves, what happens is it creates these turbulent vortices on the back end of it, which can actually inc uh, increase drag and um, you know, basically slow the shark down. And what these dendricles were thought to do was they thought it were sort of, um, were sort of lift off the skin and hold the boundary layer uh, for lamina in place. But this is sort of being debunked right now. People are actually finding that these dendricles actually create these really, really tight vortices right off of each uh, respective scale. And that enhances thrust for the actual animal instead of uh, reducing drag. Um, so, you know, essentially these large vortices will increase drag, but very, very tiny ones will um, increase thrust. And I'm not exactly sure how that works, but that's basically the where, where they're thinking that this is going. But in any event, somebody saw this, and uh, of course, you know, we all know uh, this guy, Michael Phelps, back in uh, 1980, 19, uh, 2008, excuse me, set all these records, and so did a bunch of people in Beijing, right? They set a ton of records in swimming. And um, that's probably because of the fact that they were, they were using these sort of drag-resistant surfaces on their wetsuits. And of course, this is, this is banned, banned now by uh, whatever the, uh, the, the governing body for, um, for the um, uh, swimming. Um, but essentially, uh, what, what they started doing was they created these 3D printers that were able to print these dendrical-like uh, uh, structures on a surface of a wetsuit. All right? Something that's a little more practical in this sense when it comes to large-scale, uh, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, engineering. Um, it, you know, something that's not going to be banned by FINA. Of course, this might be banned by, um, by yacht clubs. Um, are uh, these things called smart hulls. Okay? And what they do is that they're actually uh, created with these fine uh, 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 channels um, in them that uh, sort of mimic these dentricles. And what, they're also, what they found is that these dentricles actually have an antimicrobial effect. All right? Essentially, what it's thought of is that bacteria are not able to sort of sit on these, uh, on these microscopic dentricles, and they basically get uh, uh, brushed away. Same thing with barnacles and other types of microbes that are trying to hitch a ride on our uh, gorgeous mako shark here. Uh, but basically, what they're showing now is that these antimicrobial services are very good at keeping barnacles and other types of unwanted uh, organisms off of ships' hulls. And uh, essentially, this will reduce drag and enhance um, the overall flow of these uh, uh, ships and also maybe even submarines um, when they're underwater. Okay? And the concept is that bacteria, even though they might be small enough to, s to fit sort of inside here, they won't be able to divide, they won't be able to propagate, and their nutrient level will be decreased. Um, so essentially, they're, um, and also, there's, they're, if they sit across this way, they, there's not enough surface area for them to really sit down on and, 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 and latch onto. So these antimicrobial services, which are uh, a direct inspiration from these uh, shark dentricles, um, is another example of biomimicry. Um, a couple more here uh, include inspiration from whale fins. Uh, we see here as a whale fin. We see uh, the whale fins actually have these sort of um, the, these, these bumps on the front of their fins called tubercles. And uh, what that does is that people uh, always thought, um, well, actually, they didn't really know what they did. And, and I'll be honest, when I was a kid, I actually didn't know what they did either. Um, and now I do. Essentially, what it's supposed to do is actually funnels air and water flow down the back of the fin and creates these small vortices that actually create lift. All right? And you can see that a huge humpback whale here uh, actually has very, very precise movement um, in the water. And they can actually have these very tight um, uh, uh, turns um, that enable them to corral fish and things like that. And it has to do with the fact that these, uh, that these fins contain these bumps and ridges that modify the airflow across the, uh, I'm sorry, the water flow across the, the fin itself, and it helps to create a very, very sort of um, uh, 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 interesting uh, or um, uh, uh, enhanced lift uh, with respect to this type of situation. And of course, somebody took this idea and they took it and they put it on a, tur uh, a, um, a, uh, a, a turbine and um, they you know, took a tubercle uh, technology innovation, and they chewed up the, 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 way, uh, the, the propeller here. And they found that um, uh, this actually reduces uh, drag uh, and increases airflow across these turbines um, and increases efficiency. Um, one thing that uh, they've actually generated, too, are these speedo nemesis fins. Um, and I don't know if these are going to be banned by anything in general, but these basically mimic these tubercles. And uh, essentially, these are what go on your feet. And uh, they create these flows over the, uh, over, the, over, the, over the foot. And supposedly, it's supposed to enhance your overall um, swimming um, uh, enjoyment and uh, ability. 
Uh, one thing that I actually thought was really interesting that I found was um, this actually might be what a plane looks like in maybe 10 or 15 years. Okay? Planes are, uh, propeller planes are actually starting to uh, mimic these uh, sort of uh, turbicles found on, their, uh, on, 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 um, on uh, whale fins um, with, uh, with their wings. And uh, so don't be surprised if in the next 10 years you look out your wing and you see those bumps there. And that's probably because of the fact that it increases airflow and it enhances lift to enhance the efficiency of these um, situations. Again, another example of biomimetics. Um, finally, just the last two examples here I got is just a uh, yellow box fish as an inspiration for, I don't know if anybody actually ever seen this car I'm driving down the street. Um, it's actually, an, it's, uh, it was a, um, a concept car by my Mercedes Benz, and they did a lot of studies based upon drag, and um, essentially uh, uh, they, they were able to design this thing. Um, and uh, it actually, I don't know if it ever got to market. Um, I've never seen it. Uh, but basically, this is another example. And uh, finally, um, this, sorry for the, for the low, um, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, font or the, the low size here. Um, but I'm going to try to walk you through this here. Just um, some inspiration of termite mounds, um, which uh, allow for passive cooling. Um, in, um, in, uh, in various buildings. Um, there's, a, there's actually a, a really uh, nifty architectural innovation uh, that was built in the early 2000s, I believe. Uh, the Eastgate Center in Zimbabwe actually took a, uh, an example from this uh, termite mound uh, where it actually is, uh, enables passive cooling. So during the day, the building warms up, but not too hot because it's got these sort of, um, uh, it's got these kind of uh, stacks on the inside, at night, it cools down, and uh, they basically get a 90% reduction in energy consumption, utilizing inspiration from termite mounds to build and design these architectural um, uh, buildings. Not the prettiest building in the world, I mean, you know, basically, but um, essentially it is a uh, very efficient uh, building. And this was probably the first example of this type of, uh, of, of architectural ingenuity uh, that um, was seen uh, in the modern era. All right? Okay. So those are just some examples, and I want to bring you guys kind of back to the uh, overall over organizational levels of biomimicry. And everything we basically talked about was sort of, I would say, kind of on the macro level. Even the you know, dendricles, those are still kind of you know, on the micro scale. Um, and I want to kind of talk to you guys a little bit about sort of um, a new paradigm in, in biomimicry that I contend is, um, is, uh, is, is making headway and um, hopefully will I'll convince you of the same. So basically, I mentioned before that we have an organismal level, right? We have a behavioral level, and we have an ecosystem level. But I, I also strongly contend that we have a molecular level here, too, okay? It's according to biomimicry, okay? And basically, an example of this would be a synthetic molecule that mimics a natural product, all right? And in this case, form, essentially, the molecule will look like the natural product, okay? The molecule will have to look like the product that you're trying to generate. So when I talk about a natural product, I'm talking about any sort of molecule that can come from a living organism, okay? Something that comes from, let's say, um, a, an ant, or let's say a molecule that comes from a tree, something like that. Taxol, these types of molecules here that you might have heard of. Um, a lot of these uh, uh, antimicrobials, antibiotics, are actually natural products that are isolated from other organisms on, uh, on, the, pl uh, on, on the plant. It's actually easier sometimes to uh, take them from the actual organism than it is to synthesize them, just because of the synthetic complexity and the overall um, uh, 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 um, difficulty in actually synthesizing them. Um, so basically, um, a synthetic molecule that mimics a natural product could be considered an example of molecular level biomimicry, okay? The form, of course, is the molecule looks like the natural product. Uh, two, uh, the material. The molecule is essentially made from the same material as a natural product, whether it be carbon, whether it be phosphorus, whether it be something else. Uh, the construction of the natural molecule, or the, the, uh, the, the mimetic, is made in the same way as a natural product, okay? Basically, we don't want to use any sort of other um, uh, construction methods, like, um, but we can do it enzymatically. We can do it maybe uh, utilizing some other form of, uh, of, of, of um, uh, synthetic uh, uh, approach. Uh, but essentially, the construction, if we're approaching the molecular level of that at the biomimicry level of, of construction, um, the molecule can be made in the same way as a natural product. Uh, the process, uh, it's important that the molecule actually works the same way as a natural product, okay, if the natural product is, is, is generated as an antimicrobial, uh, we would hope that the molecule that we're synthesizing, or at least somewhat, uh, might work the same way as a natural product, because that's the kind of function that we're trying to, um, uh, or process, rather, that we're trying to, uh, 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 um, what's it called, uh, 
emulate. And uh, finally, function. Um, like I said, the molecule functions like the natural product in a larger context. And that means basically functions like the natural product you know, in the context of the environmental system that it's in. If you put it in a body, it's going to function the same way. All right? And so I bring up the point of two molecules here, if anybody is understanding organic chemistry. Uh, these are rather complex molecules. They have sugars on them. They're also um, uh, macrolids. Okay? And these are erythromycin and azithromycin. Okay? And erythromycin, even if you haven't had any uh, organic chemistry experience, you should be able to see that these molecules look relatively similar. Okay? They both have this large ring structure here. They both have these two sort of uh, six-membered rings hanging off the side here. And essentially, they have a lot of the same functionalities hanging off of them at each respective uh, site. Uh, there are some major differences here. There's a carbonyl oxygen uh, right here where there is not one here. And there's also uh, a, a tertiary uh, amine there. Uh, that is um, uh, present, uh, that's not present in, in erythromycin. But the point is that erythromycin is actually a natural product, and it's isolated from uh, a, a, ba a bacteria. Um, and this is actually utilized as an uh, antimicrobial um, uh, effect as well, because bacteria are constantly fighting each other, and they're constantly synthesizing molecules that will kill other microbes. All right? Now, azithromycin is actually a synthetic molecule uh, that is generated from erythromycin, However, this actually has a longer, t uh, I believe it has a longer half-life in the body, I guess, and it actually is, uh, the, the resistance to this is actually a lot less for, for their bacteria. So I just want to point out that the level of biomimicry can actually exist on a molecular level too, as opposed to um, going up from uh, you know, larger and larger scales, like uh, shark scales and buildings and cars, okay? And this is essentially where I get my inspiration from. I get my inspiration from biomimicry on a molecular level, okay? And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in the next couple minutes. So before I move on, um, I need to talk a little bit about um, proteins. And uh, what my lab does is we actually are interested in mimicking protein function, okay? And so basically up here, I'm showing just a protein structure hierarchy, all right? Proteins are made up of long chain molecules, okay? And these long chains are known as amino acid sequences, okay? Now, you can think of these as sort of just a beads on a, on a string, okay? Kind of like a string of pearls, all right? And what happens is that these string of pearls get longer and longer and longer, and what happens is they can actually begin to form secondary structure, meaning that they can form these helices or these spirals that form because of various types of physical chemical properties that these side chains or these specific links have, okay? Now, these structures can actually get bigger and bigger, and they can fold on themselves, and they can actually become very large and complex, okay? And this is basically called tertiary structure, which is essentially the first level of three-dimensional structures within a protein, okay? And again, we can talk about quaternary structure, which is another higher level of tertiary of, of, of protein structure, but this isn't going to be so important for us, all right? What I'm more important is, is having you guys understand that the overall structure of this molecule is going to dictate its function, all right? It's just like if you have a pile of girders and, or, you know, a string of girders sitting outside or a string of, uh, you know, pylons or something like that. What you have to do is you have to build them up and you have to build them up so they start to form a structure. Eventually, they're going to form a structure that looks like a building, like out there with the new dorms, that eventually they're going to form once they have all of their respective windows and their doors and their overall uh, floors uh, taken together. Uh, they're actually going to form something that is functional. Okay? And tertiary structure of a protein is what is going to define how it works in a molecular system. All right? So the three-dimensional structure of a protein dictates function. Okay, I want to I make that very clear. Okay? So what we can do is we can actually look at how proteins fold. And this is a very, very complex biophysical problem, and I'm not going to go into it here. It's beyond the scope of this lecture. But basically what I want you guys to understand is that proteins can exist both as a linear form, if we completely what is known as denature them, and they can fold up, if we're lucky, into a stable three-dimensional structure that potentially has function. All right? And what we can do is we can outfit this protein to have any function that we want, essentially, if we can mimic the overall structure of this thing. And I, you know, I say that with a very, very sort of um, uh, you know, broad stroke. We can't do anything we want with these things. But essentially, if we're lucky, we can engineer these proteins to do a wide, wide range of, uh, of, of tasks um, uh, if, we're, if we're looking at uh, certain molecular systems. Okay? 
And just to show you quick just how, um, how proteins fold, we can see here this doesn't really have any um, sort of, of color coded here. But I just wanted to show that you know, this blue here matches up with this blue here. And so what we can see, we can have some elements of secondary structure here, which is our, which are alpha helices. They sort of fold up, fold up, fold up. Finally, they fold up into this three-dimensional structure where you have this red shown here all the way to blue, showing that this linear guy can become a very tightly folded, very well-ordered three-dimensional molecular structure that we can, might be able to engineer or that we might be able to utilize uh, for uh, various types of purposes studying biology. Okay? So basically, I want to I point out that molecular structure, it dictates function, just like macromolecular structure dictates function. All right? So essentially, there are a number of uh, innovations that are being sought after right now, uh, like looking at proteins and other types of biomimetic architectures that are being, uh, being uh, uh, um, investigated. And uh, one of the things that I really am inspired by um, are molecular therapeutics uh, that are inspired by nature. All right? And so bee venom, uh, which is shown, you know, here's an, uh, I guess it's a European honeybee, um, has been shown uh, for centuries to have very sort of uh, uh, healing, for various healing processes um, and other types of, um, uh, 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 I guess, uh, ailment and uh, uh, curing um, uh, properties as well. But we're just now starting to realize and we're starting to look at the molecular nature of bee venom and how it might actually be really working in the larger context, okay? So here is a structure of melatonin, which is in bee venom, okay? This is the primary structure, and I'm not expecting you guys to know exactly what this means. But this is right here. These letters are the same as the chain that I mentioned before, okay? That, that first chain of the, sort of those pearls on a string um, are those sort of linear uh, 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 letters uh, that are shown there, okay? And if we give this thing a chance, we actually can synthesize this in the lab or we can isolate it from bee venom, it will actually fold into this three-dimensional structure right here. Okay? Now, this is a small three-dimensional structure of protein that um, actually works uh, to um, uh, 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 pol uh, pr uh, polarize cells and things like that. And uh, what they're actually showing now is that these molecules are able to form pores inside, a, uh, inside um, uh, 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 vesicles. All right? What they can do is they can actually form pores, um, and this actually has antimicrobial effects. And additionally, they're actually finding out that bee venom actually has various anti-cancer effects as well. And it's thought to interact with other proteins um, in the cell and uh, inhibit growth, uh, tumor growth and survival and also uh, inhibit invasion and metastases. All right? So again, a biomimetic approach to a complex humanistic problem. One more aspect about this is that molecular therapeutics actually can be inspired using, uh, by spider silk as well. Um, these molecules, are, our spider silk was actually generated by these things called spinnerets uh, that are um, able to generate these very, very strong, very, excuse me, um, uh, uh, highly ordered um, aggregates of, uh, of spider silk, which is actually one of the strongest known, um, uh, 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 um, I would say, substances in nature, all right? And uh, what people are now doing is they're taking spider silk and they're encapsulating, just like this spider is encapsulating this, uh, this, this, this prey here, uh, they're encapsulating drugs, small molecule drugs like doxorubicin. And what they're doing is they're embedding um, peptides in, the, in these spider silk uh, cocoons um, to target cancer cells, all right? So what they're doing is they're actually utilizing the ability for spider silk to self-aggregate, I mentioned before that nature has the ability to self-aggregate uh, self and, and uh, self-assemble. And um, these guys are now able to um, uh, impregnate these sort of spider silk cocoons with potential life-saving drugs. And they're also able to target these spider silk cocoons to a cancer cell that might be expressing certain proteins or other types of things on its surface that can be recognized by this. So we have targeted therapy with these guys, okay? And here's just some data showing that indeed they can get um, these guys to actually kill uh, cancer cells in the context of various concentrations, all right? So what my lab does is uh, we actually take inspiration from a, uh, uh, um, how are we doing on time? I got a little bit of time? Yeah, about five okay, good. Um, so basically uh, our molecules here um, are inspired from uh, scalolotoxin or scorpion venom, okay? So scorpion venom contains a variety of neurotoxins shown here, and these are all these proteins that sort of fold up 
into these stable structures. Okay? And so here are the primary sequences of these. They fold up into these alpha helices and these sort of beta sheet kind of uh, 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 orientations. Um, and these molecules have been utilized not by our lab, but by other labs, uh, to target and um, uh, bind to uh, other proteins of interest. Okay? And these, these are actually HIV fusion proteins. Okay? What my lab is interested in doing is actually utilizing these uh, miniature protein mimetics, known as scalotoxin, to target a series of uh, uh, proteins known as BCL2. Okay? And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to take this protein, we're going to engineer it, and we're going to modify it to bind to and modulate a protein within a human system or a cellular system to help us better understand these complex processes of biology. All right? Biomimetic approach. And so basically, just real quick, I'll run through this. The mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell. Basically, a lot of respiration going on here. Um, we have a family of proteins known as BCL2 that control apoptosis. There are a variety of proteins in that are anti-apoptotic or pro-apoptotic. Um, these uh, pro anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins sit on the surface of the mitochondria, and they essentially keep the cell alive. Okay? They, they keep it uh, from releasing cytochrome C. Um, and uh, essentially, we have pro-apoptotic proteins that actually cause cell to die after it's received stress. Okay? And we don't need to go through all this. Um, but basically, what I wanted to point out here was that there is a very, very specific interaction between pro- and anti-apoptotic proteins on the surface of the mitochondria. Okay? And that interaction occurs across this helix interface between one protein and another protein. And you can probably see where I'm going with this in the sense that what we want to do is we want to mimic this helix with the helix of scalolotoxin. And why would we want to do that? Well, the point is, is the sense that there are a huge degree of crosstalk amongst various types of BCL2 proteins, and this is a very, very, very complex network of inter intercellular signaling processes. Okay? And so basically what we want to do is we want to design molecules that are able to mimic this interaction interface to target these particular proteins so we can better understand this complex process that is very poorly understood at this point, or relatively poorly understood at this point. Okay? And just to talk about how we rationally design these molecules, we go ahead and we sort of synthesize the, 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 um, the back protein, which is shown here. This is that small helix, and we mimic the, um, the, the, uh, the overall um, uh, structure and sequence with our scalotoxin. And uh, we can see here that it aligns very, very nicely with an RMSD of about 9.926. Um, finally, what we do is we uh, take a look at the structure. Uh, we take a look at binding efficiency of these particular molecules. And uh, what we found is that if we remove the structural cysteines, which isn't really all that important for here, we actually can get these things to bind very, very nicely uh, within our system. Okay? So essentially, our lab um, is, is trying to design biomimetic approaches um, to, uh, to binding and modulating proteins of interest so we can better understand complex disease processes. Sort of what we're doing is we're engineering scalolotoxins and scorpion toxins to use as tools so we can better understand um, uh, uh, biological systems of interest. Okay? And so hopefully I'll just wrap up to maybe convince you, hopefully I convinced you that biomimetics is you know, a relatively important field um, and that it is um, you know, essentially a very inspirational field. And uh, I just want to reiterate that um, it is the imitation of nature for the purpose of solving complex problems. Um, the concept of, uh, as itself has influenced many fields uh, from art to engineering and all the way out to biology and physics, of course. Um, what I also wanted to mention was the fact that recent developments, especially in highly sophisticated imaging equipment, has you know, effectively revolutionized biomimetics. And you know, essentially, the way that this is working is um, uh, the way that the whole field is going um, is, is uh, essentially reliant on, uh, on these uh, highly sophisticated imaging equipment um, in general. Um, and I hope to maybe convince you that biomimicry in general as a philosophy has led to a deeper understanding of our appreciation for the natural world. And maybe even you guys um, out there maybe have a new inspiration or new, uh, 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 under, a deeper understanding or appreciation for the entire natural world. So when you go home and you look at those trees, start to think about how you might be able to utilize that in your own, um, uh, uh, your own innovations. And so um, basically, biomimicry in general is sort of becoming a, a, a philosophy. And it, you know, the, they're the forefathers of biomimicry are actually, are actually starting to go out and give a lot of talks as philosophers. They're starting to talk about how they can influence business models and all sorts of other stuff. There's countless books written on this subject. 
And um, essentially what it does is it asks us to explore uh, how nature solves uh, complex design challenges. And uh, what I hope to have convinced you is that essentially what we really need to do is we need to take another look at how a lot of these systems that we've designed over the last maybe 500 years are really, um, are really uh, how we've approached these. And I contend that we probably must rework a lot of the many modern designs and ask entirely different questions as to how this is working. And um, additionally, uh, biomimicry as a philosophy has begun to apply to business models, essentially how to design an innovative business. And um, hopefully, uh, nature will continue to inspire human innovation. Of course, it's got a 3.8 billion year head start, so um, we have a lot of catching up to do. Um, but essentially, I hope that I convinced you that um, uh, you know, inspiring uh, human innovation uh, coming from nature is um, a very uh, relevant and um, uh, important concept. Okay? And just some acknowledgments here, some of the graduate students that did some of the work, and my undergraduates especially, who are sitting out in the audience, Zach, of course, Mary, and uh, Sawyer and Dylan, they just joined the lab, well, a couple months ago, but they're doing fantastic work in our lab, and uh, just some technical support, uh, Dr. Hao Chen and Dr. Hines, um, and of course, uh, pro PACE program for Zach, and um, also Office for Response, Future Response programs for some of the research that I've done. So, I thank you very much for your attention, and since I'm standing in between you and studying for finals, I will give it up to any questions that you guys have. Thank you. Cushion. You want the microphone? Gotta yell it. Okay, great. That's a good question. So this, the question is, is that whether or not the sequence or the secondary structure of the protein is more important. And actually what we're finding out is the sequence is more important. Because what we're finding out now is we actually don't even need the secondary structure to begin with, as long as it has the propensity to be able to fold into that stable secondary structure. So if you take a quick look, it, if we take a look back here, sorry. Ay, 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 this thing is killing me. Yeah, so if we take a look back here, um, so here is the actual structure of our, here's the actual primary sequence of wild type sclerotoxin. And uh, we're basically, if we have cysteines present at these Bs, these are amino butyric acid, if we take those out, uh, with cysteines, and we, we take out the cysteines in general, we actually do find that they bind a lot better than they do if they're completely structured. And this is important, right? Because this actually might be of this, you know, when we first got this result where we didn't get any binding with the structured molecule, we were sort of not really crestfallen, but we were like, okay, well, what are we going to do now? Now we've taken out all of the secondary structure formulation of this until it gets in the context of the protein that it's trying to bind. And this is actually an interesting concept because we might be able to utilize these molecules as tools to help us better understand binding kinetics and actually entropic penalties and things like that that need to be overcome in order for these things to bind, right? So what we can do is now we're actually going down the line and saying, okay, which cysteines do we need or which, like if we just maybe put one in there, maybe just kind of tweak it so it'll form a secondary structure, maybe we'll get a better binder, who knows? But essentially right now what we have is we have, we're sitting on kind of a tool to help us sort of walk down the, um, I guess, the kinetic ladder here and look to see how well these things are binding in the context of uh, various protein-protein interactions. But that's not to say that what we can't do now is very, very um, uh, systematically vary these, uh, these side chain residues and look to see which residues are more important, okay? So in order, secondary structure seems to be, it, it doesn't necessarily seem to be important for binding, but it has to be able to form that secondary structure, right? Okay. Any other questions? Any students left out there? Wait, what question? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go, yep, yep. Are 
Sure, absolutely. So we're talking about a little bit about the trajectory of evolution and how it's, how it's going to be, you know, how that influences. And I think that's a great question. The question is, is that are we, what, even though when we're mimicking these things that we're finding in nature, are we missing anything that might actually be on a trajectory of evolution that we're not seeing? And that's a great question. And I, I mean, I don't really have a, 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 I don't really have a concrete answer. But what I could possibly say is that evolution is a relatively slow process, right? And so I think that for us to be able to catch up to this point at this point in time and our innovations that are going to be able to be, I guess, um, uh, formulated from learning from nature at this, point in the, at this point of natural evolution, I think that we have a pretty good chance of catching a snapshot of it. But that's not to say that within, you know, 500 years, you know, a whale's, you know, fin is going to be a lot different, right? So I, the short answer is I, I think that we probably have a good chance of being able to, to catch it as it is, but um, I think that it's a, it's a moving target. And I think that we're always going to have to be constantly reevaluating our own systems um, to be able to, uh, to, to, and our own innovations to be able to keep up with nature. One of the things that I was reading about in this, you know, for you know, developing this talk was um, the fact that even now, not even just, it's not even about biomimicry in the physical world. We're now actually talking about biomimicry for uh, looking at how businesses are run and, and how um, certain societies in nature are correlated and things like that, like certain social and um, different types of um, uh, uh, hierarchies that are occurring amongst uh, you social animals, social animals, parasocial animals. And so in general, I think that, you know, if, if we take a look at biomimicry as, as our own evolution occurs sociologically, I think that that's a completely different, or, or you know, another way to look at it, right? Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Good luck on finals, and have a great break. <laughs>